Joe James. In this video, I'm going to explain Floyd Warshall's algorithm. Floyd Warshall's algorithm is used to find the shortest path between every pair of vertices in a graph. So it's known as an all pairs shortest paths algorithm. It supports negative edge weights, but not negative weight cycles. It runs in big O of n cubed time. Yeah, that sounds pretty slow, but it does a lot of work. It finds a lot of uh, shortest distances. So in a large graph where you have a lot of pairs, it finds the distance between all of the pairs. And it works by increasing the number of hops allowed by one with each iteration. So let me explain that. Let's say you have this simple graph here, and we're just looking for the distance between A and D. At iteration zero, we can see the distance is 30. There's a direct path from A to D. Now in the first iteration, we're also allowed to visit vertex B if we want, if we can find a shorter path that way. And we do, in fact. So we find that there's a shorter path passing through B of only 25. And in the third iteration, we can also visit vertex C. We compare our current shortest path, which is 25, to the path that we would get by visiting vertex C, which is only 15. In a nutshell, that's how Floyd Warshall's algorithm works. Now let's look at a more detailed example. Let's apply Floyd Warshall's algorithm to this directed graph. So we have only four vertices here and six edges. So we'll start by setting up a couple of tables. And what we're going to find is the shortest distance from the vertex on the left column to the vertex on the right row. And that's what each cell in this matrix represents. The distance from any vertex to itself is always going to be zero. Keep in mind there are no negative cycles, so you cannot do better than zero. The ones that have a direct path, for example, b to a of negative 2, we can put b to a has a distance of negative 2. So those have a direct path. We'll populate those into this table immediately. Distance 0. That means in our zeroth iteration. And then we'll also track pi, the predecessor vertex. So in this case, for instance, b to a, the predecessor vertex, is b. Now for the first iteration, we're going to copy these two tables down below and we're going to look at each cell one by one and see if we can improve on that distance by stopping at vertex A on the way. So what we're going to do is with each iteration, with iteration 0, we're going to use tables D0 and Pi0, which I show here, and we're not going to make any pit stops, so that only reflects direct edges between one vertex and the next. With the first iteration, we're going to say, well, well what it, can we find a shorter path by stopping at vertex A? With the second iteration, we're going to say, can we find a shorter path by stopping at vertex B? And so on. And we're going to look at every single square in the table with each iteration. That's how we get n cubed. There are n squared boxes in this table, and we're going to go through the table n times. So with the first iteration, we're going to say, well, we can stop at vertex A. We want to go from this vertex to this vertex and see if we can find a shorter path by stopping at vertex A. So the first row we're going to see that it doesn't make sense to loop from vertex A to vertex A and then go to the vertex we're going to. So in other words from A to A by stopping at vertex A. Uh, we would just be making a loop here. That's not going to change. And the second one we go from A to A plus a to b, is that less than a to b? No, because a to a is going to be zero, and so we're adding zero to anything. And the same with the third one, a to a plus a to c. So anytime you're going from one vertex to itself, and then onto the other vertex, is it shorter? No, it's not. And the fourth one's going to be no, too. Uh, now it's a little more interesting. So we're going from b to a, and then a to a. In other words, we want to go from b to a, while stopping at vertex a. Well, since the destination vertex is A, no, it doesn't make any difference. Now we want to go from B to B. Well, we already have a zero there. It doesn't get any better than zero. Here it gets interesting. So we're going from B to C, and we can stop at A. So in other words, we go from B to A, and then A to C. So what's B to A? Negative 2. And A to C is 3. So we add negative 2 and 3 together, and we get 1. So graphically, you can say, well, we're going from B to A and then A to C. So we had a distance from B to C of infinity because there's no direct edge yet, right? That's all we know in iteration D0. There's no direct edge. But in iteration 1, we can look at edges that stop at A on the way to our vertex. So B to A and A to C gives us a total distance of 1. So we'll populate this table with 1 with a predecessor vertex of A. 
and we'll look at the next one. And the next one actually turns out, yes, we have an advantage here too. So B to A plus A to D. And on the table here, we're looking from B to A is negative 2, and A to D is 0. So we get a distance of negative 2. So we can populate that in this table. And on the graph, B to A and A to D. So we're taking this route here. And where our predecessor for this uh, B to D is A, because we stopped at vertex A on the way to D. So uh, the distance from C to A plus A to A is not going to be less than anything, because C to A is infinity. Going from C to any vertex and stopping at A is not going to help us. So this whole row, the answer is going to be no, because this distance is infinity. So adding infinity to any distance is not going to make it shorter. So this is a no. This is a no, of course. And this is a no, because we're adding infinity to it. And in the last row, we can also see that we're adding infinity to any distance, right? Stopping at A on the way to any vertex, well, just the distance from D to A is infinity, so adding infinity to any, any of these distances is just going to make it longer. So the distances from D to each of these vertices cannot be improved by stopping at A. So now we're done with the first iteration. For the second iteration, we're going to take this table from iteration 1, and we're going to copy it into iteration 2. We're going to go through the same values one by one and ask the same questions, except this time we're going to stop at vertex B. Can we get from A to A by stopping at B? In other words, A to B and then B to A. That's obviously not going to be shorter. Can we go from A to B and then B to B? That's not going to be shorter than infinity. How about if we want to go from A to C? Can we go from A to B and then B to C? Well, A to B is infinity, so no, that's not going to be shorter and so on. And, and so we go through this whole iteration and what we find is that down here at the bottom we actually do get some advantage. So if we're going from D to A by stopping at vertex B, in other words we go from D to B which costs us 4 and we go from B to D which is negative 2, we get a distance of 2 and we can see it here as well. We go from D to B which is 4 and B to A which is negative 2. So we get a total distance from D to A of 2. And we populate that in the table and put a predecessor of b in the pi value. And the same thing for d to c. We can stop at b, and then b already has a distance from b to c of 1 only. So we get there in 4 plus 1, 5. We populate the value of 5. And we can look at it tabularly. Actually, we should be looking at the d1 table, because these are actually the values that the algorithm is going to look at. It's going to look at the preceding iteration values. So D to B is 4 plus B to C is 1. So we get a total of 5. 4 plus 1, 5. When we populate that in the table, we put a predecessor of B. Now we're done with the second iteration. I kind of zoomed through this, but if you understand how to calculate each square, that's what's important. And then for the third iteration, we're going to copy the D2 values down to the D3 table. So we have a starting point. We're going to look at every single square to see if we can improve our distances by stopping at vertex C. And it turns out we can't. And that makes sense because there are not a whole lot of edges going into vertex C, only this one from A. And you're not going to get anywhere from A faster by stopping at C because A already has a path of 0 to D. And you can't get to B cheaper. So it makes sense that there will be no changes in this iteration by looking at the graph. Stopping at C simply doesn't help us. And in the fourth iteration, we're allowed to stop at vertex D. I already filled in the values here. The only two values that change is from C to A and C to B. So in other words, we're going from... C to D, and then D to A. So let's look at C to D up here. C to D is 5, and then D to A is 2, so that's 7. We populate 7 in this table because it's less than infinity that we had. We had infinity, we have infinity here. We're trying to get from C to B by stopping at vertex D. So in other words, we go C to D and D to B, right? So C to D is 5, and D to B is 4, so we get a distance of 9. 9 is better than infinity. And we can see that on the graph, stopping at vertex D, C to B has a distance of 9, 5 plus 4, and C to A has a nicer distance. So before we had infinity getting from C to A because we were not allowed to stop at vertex D. Now we can stop at vertex D, we get 5, 4, and negative 2, so we get 7 to get to A. Whereas before we had no route at all to get to A. So we have to stop at D to get to A and B. So in the fourth iteration, uh, these two values change. 
We add the predecessor as vertex D because we're stopping at vertex D. That wraps up this example of Floyd Warshaw's algorithm. So now we've found the shortest distance from each vertex to every other vertex in the graph and the predecessor so we know which route we took. I hope you liked this video. If so, please give me the thumbs up button and click subscribe. I'm Joe James. Thanks for watching.